should married men go home begins on a note of connubial bliss unheard of in a Laurel and Hardy comedy. There is, however, a serpent in golf knickers galumping down on paradise. And a warm welcome back to the Laurel and Hardy blogcast. I'm your host, Patrick Vasey, the author of the Laurel and Hardy blog, and you're listening to episode 19. Today's show is focusing on the very first officially titled Laurel and Hardy comedy, which is the 1928 silent short, Should Married Men Go Home? And joining me a little later to discuss this classic short is returning guest and author of the Laurel and Hardy encyclopedia and friend of the blogcast, Glenn Mitchell. Before we dive into all of that, though, there are a couple of big thank yous in order. Firstly, a thousand thanks. Go to Stephen Joseph, who left me a five-star rating and this review. Laurel and Hardy Blogcast, the best. I've only recently discovered the Laurel and Hardy Blogcast, and it's quickly become my all-time favourite, from the in-depth reviews of the pictures in chronological order to the insightful interviews of Laurel and Hardy experts and fans. This blogcast is a must-subscribe for any fans of the boys or classic comedy enthusiasts. It's as though this blogcast were made especially for me, and I couldn't love it more. Cheers. Stephen, thank you so much for leaving that review. I really appreciate it. And also... A thousand thanks. Go to JTP527, which must be a droid off Star Wars, um, who left me a uh, a wonderful review. It really made my day reading this one, uh, as well as a five-star rating. And this review reads, Here's another fine podcast you've gotten me into. I learned of this podcast, or blogcast as it's referred to, by none other than Randy Scretvet, who is one of, if not the most, leading historians, experts and researchers of Laurel and Hardy. And I'm so glad I did. The creator, producer and host is Patrick Vasey. That's me. Patrick Vasey has set up an ambitious goal for himself. Each episode focuses on a Laurel and Hardy film. He's working his way chronologically, beginning with The Lucky Dog, 1921, and moving forward. He's had some bonus blogcasts focusing on related subjects. Since Laurel and Hardy made over 100 films, he'll be doing this for a long time. Yeah, won't I ever. Um, Each episode features an interview with a Laurel and Hardy expert, and the conversation is positively fascinating. So far, most of the programmes run well over an hour, and that's fine with me. If one has a copy of the film under discussion, it would be a fun idea to watch it in tandem with the episode. This podcast is a godsend for lifelong Laurel and Hardy fans such as myself, and I believe it will be essential for newer fans who want to learn more about this great comedy team. These are good times for Laurel and Hardy. Their films are finally undergoing much-needed restoration and are more readily available through home video platforms. Collectors are on the lookout for lost prints, and there are many fine books available, including the aforementioned Mr. Skrepvet's book, Laurel and Hardy, The Magic Behind the Movies. This podcast has the potential to be an important clearinghouse for future trends and developments. As such, it comes highly recommended. And I couldn't have written that better myself. <laughs> uh, thank you very much, JTP527, whoever you are. I'd love to know who you are. Um, but you know, thanks so much for those um, those reviews and, uh, and the ratings. I really, really appreciate it. It's fantastic. And finally, I really want to say a thousand thanks uh, to David Crump, who very kindly sent me a copy of his new book entitled Fred Carnot, The Legend Behind the Laughter. Uh, And I've got to say, what a wonderful book this is. Uh, I've got to admit, previously, I had only a passing interest in Fred Carnot, um, sort of limited only to his connection to Stan Laurel and later to the Hal Roach Studios, albeit a very brief spell at the studio. But David's book tells an utterly compelling story of a fascinating character a truly fascinating character Uh, and what's more I was also invited to attend the official book launch in early December which was a lovely event in and of itself Um, and David gave a really interesting and entertaining illustrated talk about Carno his connections with Chaplin and Laurel and also dispelled many myths and lies spread about Carno in the past 
Uh, for Laurel and Hardy fans, this book has really interesting stories and facts about the boys, um, Carno's failed employment at the Roach Studios. Oh, and actually, there's a really fascinating part about Charlie Hall. Um, but besides all that, the, the Carno story at the heart of it is a, a rags to riches and back again story. And it is it is really, really compelling. Um, David has done such a great job with this book. It's incredibly well researched. Um, it was 10 years in the making, I believe. Um, it's a beautifully glossy paperback. It it runs to about 600 pages with lots of lovely uh, pin sharp images throughout um, and I would very much recommend this to any Laurel and Hardy fan uh, or just a fan of comedy in general. Um, it's got a foreword by the great David Robinson um, and is published by Bruin Books and, and at just under £20 it's an absolute bargain, highly recommended. Um, as usual I will put a link to audio copy if you're interested in the show notes of the podcast. Um, oh, and I'm very pleased to say that David will be joining me on the blogcast in February to talk about the book and uh, Carno's Laurel and Hardy connections too, so do look out for that. Um, and so, with all that said, let's get into today's film in focus. Today's film in focus is Should Married Men Go Home? It was a two-reeler, filmed 11th of March to the 21st of March 1928, and it was released on the 8th of September 1928. It was produced by Hal Roach, directed by James Parrott, photographed by George Stevens. Should Married Men Go Home is an average Laurel and Hardy picture from this period. The boy's official biographer, John McCabe, wrote somewhat dismissively of the comedy, suggesting that Stan and Babe could and perhaps should have done better with the material at hand. And yet, the film can claim a uniquely significant status in the Laurel and Hardy filmography. The popularity of the Laurel and Hardy team had dramatically increased, film by film, since the studio had teamed them the previous summer. Across the board, from the exhibitors and their movie-going patrons, to the trade reviewers and, all importantly, the executives at Roach's distributor, MGM, all were unanimously won over by Stan and Ollie's on-screen antics. Laurel and Hardy had become household names, despite not having their own designated series. However, things were not so rosy for another comic at the Roach studio. Max Davidson had joined the Roach lot in 1926 and had enjoyed considerable success quickly rising from the All-Star stable to become the lead comic of his own series. Davidson's particular brand of ethnic, specifically Jewish humour, was very popular with audiences in the late 1920s. Unfortunately for Davidson, his luck changed when Roach's contract with his distributor, Pathé Exchange, expired and a new agreement was formed with Hollywood giant MGM. From the outset, the MGM executives were not supporters of Davidson's work and they did not hide their displeasure. A telegram sent on the 14th of September 1927 from Warren Doan to his boss, Hal Roach, illustrates that MGM's feelings concerning the Davidson series must have been immediately evident and the Roach Studios management team was already considering a proactive response. Quote, McCary, Walker, myself, wish your opinion of a little later on suggesting to Metro, furnishing to them pictures with this comedy team, Laurel and Hardy, in place of Davidson's. Leo Fields would be entirely practical, make very good Roach Star series without Laurel and Hardy, and we all feel time is here to start intensive development on Laurel and Hardy, at the same time using Roach Star series to develop new talent. Stop. It's unclear why Davidson's comedies were not popular with the MGM executives. In his excellent essay, Recording Max Davidson's History, Richard W. Ban theorised about the reasons for MGM's stance. Quote, Presumably what bothered both MGM executives, Nicholas Schenk and Louis B. Mayer, was their connection with presenting an unassimilated Jew as though it were typical of whom the Jews were in America in 1927. It was important, they believed, to steer clear of anything that might provoke anti-Semitism. They reasoned that called for suppression of all Jewishness in their movies. As a result, Davidson's contract with the Halrich studio was duly terminated, although he would still appear as a supporting player in future Roach comedies. As suggested by Doan back in September 1927, the Max Davidson series was immediately replaced with the new Laurel and Hardy series. Motion Picture News, 5th of May 1928, reported. Quote, Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy have been transferred from the All-Star series, as they have proven during the past year that their personalities overshadow any descriptive title which might be applied to their comedies. They will continue next year in the type of comedies that have proven so popular. 
Even though this was a, sig a significant change, a promotion of sorts for Stan and Babe, it was business as usual in practical terms. No sooner had filming finished on their purple moment, the final retakes being completed on the 7th of March 1928, Stan and the rest of the writing team were back in conference. The relentless production schedule at the Hal Roach studio meant that the very moment the last film wrapped, work immediately started on producing the next script, or at least the very nucleus of an idea that Stan and Babe could develop on set. Where we can only surmise that their purple moment took inspiration from Stan and Babe's domestic entanglements, pitting the boys against overbearing wives, there's no doubt whatsoever that their follow-up picture was inspired by real life. By the title, Should Married Men Go Home, one could easily be forgiven for thinking that this latest picture followed suit by using marital battles as its central theme. The first scene does indeed present Ollie as escaping his wife to spend time with Stan, however the overarching influence on the film is not the boys' relationships. Instead, they used another significant love of Babe Hardy's life, his beloved pastime of golf. Hardy was reputedly a formidable golfer, certainly amongst the Hollywood community. He'd been introduced to the game by star comedian Larry Semin back in 1921, the same year that he first worked with Stan in the G.M. Anderson pilot film The Lucky Dog. Babe's love of golf is a long-established part of Laurel and Hardy lore, and perhaps one of the most oft-repeated facts about the comedy team is that while Stan stayed behind to toil with the editing of their pictures, Babe was desperate to clock off and hit the links. There was something of a golfing culture prevalent throughout the Hal Roach studios too, with prominent staffers such as Bob McGowan, Edgar Kennedy and Hal Roach regularly frequenting the links alongside Babe at the Lakeside Country Club. In addition, the studios held an annual golfing tournament during the summer holidays, the conclusion of which would inevitably see Hardy crowned as champion. In conversation with Richard W. Ban, Richard Courier, head of Roach's editing department from 1920 to 1932, spoke warmly of these annual competitions. Quote, oh gosh, we had fun on those. Babe Hardy was the man to beat. He could hit the ball a ton. Hal Roach was stronger than anyone. He could really power that ball too, but sometimes the boss played his short game off the tee. Sometimes he laughed and shook it off. Sometimes you would see him throw his club as far as hard he could hit the ball with his driver. In 1967, also in conversation with Richard W. Ban, Hal Roach himself reflected, quote, Every year, more or less, we used to have a golf tournament at the studio. Everybody played, no matter how bad. Now, Babe Hardy and Bob McGowan and I used to play a bit of golf at Lakeside, but Hardy was the best golfer around, and he used to win the thing nearly every time and get the trophy. We'd all play and have a good time. Once in a while, someone would get an idea for a picture from the thing. One year it would be Charlie Chase, another year Laurel and Hardy, or the gang, and so on. And so it was that the shared love of golf at the studio became the inspiration for the first picture in the officially designated Laurel and Hardy series. Hal Roach credited the story idea for Should Married Men Go Home to supervising director Leo McCary. McCary had apparently devised the basic idea for the picture after playing a round of golf at the Lakeside Country Club, and Roach gave it the green light. Filmed during the spring of 1928, the opening scene of Should Married Men Go Home is one in contrast to reality. Here we see a picture of domestic bliss, as Ollie and his wife, played by Cadalese, returning for the second film in a row, sit cuddling on the sofa. Yet behind closed doors, Oliver's actual marriage with his wife Myrtle was far from blissful. Myrtle suffered from alcoholism, and despite the genuine love and affection that the two had for each other, her addiction took a heavy toll on the couple, eventually ending in divorce in 1937. But with the stage set, we cut to a beautiful tracking shot by cameraman George Stevens of Stan walking down the street, heading for the hardy home in full golfing attire. Several good gags follow where Ollie and his wife pretend not to be home. Stan rather determinedly keeps knocking at the door, refusing to believe his pal is not at home. He even raps at the door with his golf club in his frustration. Eventually, he writes a note and pushes it halfway under the door, and Ollie, thinking Stan has left, pulls it through the rest of the way. Stan witnesses the note disappear and, realising that Ollie must be at home, starts knocking again. Mrs Hardy is disgusted at her husband's stupidity in giving the game away and the two begin throttling each other behind the door. After a short while, the Hardys assume Stan has left and peep discreetly out of the window to check. Just at the exact moment as Stan looks through the window to peep in. 
The three find themselves peering at each other face to face and Stan's broad smile is just hilarious. The boys would revisit and arguably improve upon this sequence in their 1931 talkie Come Clean with Gertrude Astor wonderfully playing a very memorable Mrs Hardy. Stan enters the house and the Hardy's blissful afternoon is over. There's a deliciously awkward moment where the three sit in complete silence and Ollie just stares at Stan. Finally, the unwelcome house guest lights up a cigarette and nearly sets the room ablaze. In the short few moments that follow, Stan unwittingly tears down one of the window blinds and puts his foot through the seat of a chair. And then causing even more stress to the married couple, he begins to approach Ollie's fancy-looking phonograph player. And then in typical Laurel and Hardy style, Ollie leaps in to intercept him with the old I'll do it, you might break it routine. And of course, Hardy proceeds to destroy the machine himself. Well, this is the final straw for Mrs Hardy, who tells them both to get out and go to the golf course. Ollie immediately peels off his dressing gown to reveal that he's already fully dressed in his plus fours. At the golf club, we learn that it's foursomes day, and so the boys team up with a couple of young ladies, played by Edna Marion and Viola Richard. Sadly, this would be the last film that the ladies would appear credited in with Stan and Babe, as three days before filming began, they, along with Dorothy Coburn, also with a small role in this picture, received confirmation that the studio was terminating their contracts. All three made valuable contributions to the films in which they appeared and supported all the major series on the lot, displaying considerable versatility. The decision to offload these ladies in one fell swoop is difficult to understand, and adding to the confusion, the previously mentioned article in Motion Picture News from 5th of May 1928 that highlighted the Roach Studios' plans for the coming season also explicitly noted, quote, Edna Marion and Viola Richard, Hal Roach comedy beauties, will appear again in support of various stars, but several additional beauties will also be cast in similar roles. Following their departure from the lot, they appeared in only a handful of films and eventually disappeared altogether from the Hollywood radar. The fact that all three women put in one final performance, typically characterful and with smiles on their faces, is a testament to their professionalism. The locations used for the final two-thirds of the film are worthy of note here too. For the golf club scenes, two real-life courses were utilised. Due to its proximity to the studio, the first and most used was the Fox Hills golf course, easily identifiable due to the large oil derricks in the background. The second location used was the newly opened Westwood Public Golf Course, owned by a friend of Hal Roach. In return for the kudos of having a Hollywood movie shot on the links of the new course, the studio benefited by being charged less than they had been at Fox Hills. One small sequence located just outside the cafe of the fictional Vista Golf Club was shot using the ivy-clad administration building of the Hal Roach Studios as an impressive backdrop. It's a real treat to see the familiar studio buildings used in this way in a movie. Before they begin their round of golf, the girls convince Stan and Ollie to buy a round of drinks in the cafe. In a forerunner of the fan favourite scene in Men of War, the boys can only afford three drinks, or so they think. Charlie Hall plays the part of the soda jerk, but you'd be forgiven for missing him as he's barely noticeable, unlike the later and much enhanced reboot of the scene where James Finlayson gives a typically hilarious performance as Hall's counterpart. In addition, the inclusion of spoken dialogue in Men of War gives the gags the fullness they deserve and make the later effort the dominant version. Another supporting player that does enhance the picture is the returning and this time toupee-wearing Edgar Kennedy. Kennedy plays his usual grumpy, no-nonsense character that doesn't suffer fools gladly. He plays a fellow golfer and he absolutely does not want to have his game held up by a couple of dimwits. With Stan watching on, there's a great gag in which Kennedy takes a swing at the ball and as he follows through, his hairpiece falls off. As he hits the ball, he also succeeds in digging up a large patch of turf, complete with a daisy poking out of the top. Stan picks up the turf, and Kennedy angrily snatches it off him, and without looking, places it on top of his head, mistaking it for his wig. Stan, easily bemused, as always, is left holding the hairpiece, and decides that the best course of action is to stomp the wig into the rut where Kennedy's club initially dug out the turf. As many scenes uh, uh, were shot on location, this picture has a bright and airy feel. The action on the golf course is littered with amusing moments, but sadly it never reaches the heights that we might expect. 
In their private time, Stan occasionally joined Babe and pals for a round of golf, but not being much of a golfer himself, he would constantly be acting the fool with his clubs and golf balls and keeping everyone in stitches. It's a shame that Stan was unable to reproduce this level of amusing antics in the picture. It's a decent enough little film, but doesn't compare well to much of their other work. It's relatively slow paced throughout, and the quality of the gags aren't sufficiently funny enough to elevate the comedy to their usual standard. John McCabe clearly thought they could have done so much more. Quote, McCary liked the idea, and the film began shooting. But the usual gag of Munton Irishman came a cropper on this one. Had McCary concentrated on the realistic problems of golfing, a more meaningful comedy would have resulted. As it is, the film is simply a set of adults playing with mud pies and appealing to viewers on about that level of sophistication. As described above, the film builds slowly up to its grand climax, the kind that had quickly become one of their trademarks, a messy tit-for-tat ending. Stan, Babe, Kennedy, Coburn, Richards and Marion and every other golfer within striking distance get drawn into a scene of mud-slinging carnage. All of the combatants inevitably fall or get thrown into a vast muddy hole, including Stan, who is thrown in by a gigantic golfer played by 7 foot 2 inch Norwegian actor John Arson, who was notable for his role as a giant in Harold Lloyd's Why Worry. Now, as unsatisfactory as this low comedy ending might be to a more discerning modern audience attempting any form of analysis, and as is the case with their purple moment, one must always consider the film's context. In 1970, Laurel and Hardy's principal cameraman, George Stevens, who would later become one of the most noted directors in Hollywood, defended the studio. Quote, That was the old style of comedy, from the old school. Sometimes with Laurel and Hardy, the story wasn't always there, but they'd keep trying things, changing things. When you do that, and you're done, the structure may not be linear, but that never mattered at Roach if the audience laughed. That's all you're looking for, is sustaining that laughter. Throwing mud around is low comedy, but run that for an audience. Every preview we had on that one, should married men go home, audiences laughed. That was such a reward with those two guys, hearing audiences rock with laughter. They were marvellous clowns. A fascinating and rare look behind the scenes of a Laurel and Hardy picture was presented in 2012, when a 16mm home movie shot on the set of Should Married Men Go Home by a vaudevillian named George Mann was published on YouTube by Mann's son Brad Smith. This film is an incredibly rare and candid record of the fun and friendly interactions between the players on a Hal Roach comedy set. The intriguing footage shows George Mann fooling around on the golf course with Stan and Babe and most of the co-stars, including Edgar Kennedy and John Arson. One can really get a sense of how much the actors enjoyed being on set with each other and making these pictures. Filming on Should Married Men Go Home wrapped on Wednesday the 21st of March 1928, and at midnight that same evening, Stan and Babe appeared live on stage as part of a Red Cross relief fundraiser for St Francis Dam disaster victims. The benefit performance held at the Los Angeles Metropolitan Theatre featured 150 stars, including Viola Richard, Charlie Chase, Max Davidson and Dorothy Coburn. The St Francis Dam burst on the 12th of March and flooded the San Francisco Canyon, claiming around 600 lives. Then on the 26th of March, the Halrich Studios closed down for their annual spring holiday. In April, Babe and Myrtle joined with director James Parrott, editor Richard Currier and gagman Charlie Rogers and several other Roach Studio staff members for a road trip across the border to Vancouver. While being a well-earned vacation, the trip also had an ulterior motive, the acquisition of alcohol. The US was, of course, still in the grips of prohibition, so the trip to Canada was a way of legally purchasing some bottles of booze and illegally smuggling it back home. It appears to have been a fun-filled trip, especially once they'd crossed into Canada and left Prohibition behind them. Babe must have had to have been particularly mindful of his wife Myrtle, though, being amongst friends with a carefree holiday atmosphere and alcohol flowing freely. John McCabe suggests that Stan went along too, but there is some doubt whether this was the case. He doesn't appear in any of the wonderful photographs from the trip found in Babe's personal scrapbook and reproduced in Randy Scretvet's updated version of The Magic Behind the Movies it's more likely that Stan spent some time at home with his wife and their new baby, Lois. 
As the studio got back to work after its spring hiatus, a few retakes for the boys' only golf-themed comedy were filmed in early May, and the following month, on the 17th of June, the annual Roach Golf Tournament was held at the Riverside Country Club near Hollywood. A full-page spread highlighting the event appeared in Exhibitors Herald and Moving Picture World on the 4th of August, 1928, presenting a gallery of images featuring the contestants in full swing. Among the participants pictured were Stan and Babe, Charlie Chase, George Stevens, H.M. Walker, Bob McGowan, Len Powers, Edgar Kennedy and James Parrott. All gentlemen are taking their shots very seriously, apart from Stan, who is attempting to use his club like a billiards cue. Should Married Men Go Home was released domestically on the 8th of September 1928, and an early preview received a lukewarm review from Chester J. Smith, writing in Motion Picture News, 28th of July 1928. Quote, That popular combination, Stan Laurel and Oliver Hardy, are starred in this Hal Roach comedy, whose action develops largely in a mud hole on the golf course. The picture is by no means the best Laurel and Hardy have done, but it's passable. There are spots in it that are very funny, but the comedians have had much better material to work upon in the past. Once the film was in theatres, however, exhibitors were not so standoffish, and their reviews once again proved that the studio made the right call. That so-called low comedy always received high praise, as the following reviews illustrate. Boy, what a pair of comedians these boys are. They play or dig a few rounds of golf in this one, and how. It's a wow. Book it, from the Central Theatre, Selkirk, Manitoba. There's as much difference between metro comedies and others as there is between a pipe organ and a banjo. <laughs> from the Texas Theatre, Grand Prairie, Texas. Very good comedy will please the golf bugs, from the Adair Theatre, Adair, Iowa. The Laurel Hardy comedy, Should Married Men Go Home, is heralded as one of their best to date and is certain contains a lot of laughs. The Billings Gazette, 9th of December 1928. The funniest team in pictures in another riot. This time it's mudslinging. Patrons are asking for Laurel and Hardy. From the Egyptian Theatre, Pennsylvania. One of the funniest to date. This pair is always good. 100% laughs on every Laurel Hardy so far. From the Opera House, Fort Payne, Alabama. This pair have the world cheated in making good laughing comedies. Nuff said. Real Joy Theatre, King City, California. And finally, sometime later when I get through laughing, I'll tell you about this one from the Empress Theatre, Akron in Iowa. Uh, and if you want to have a look at the full page uh, promotional piece uh, of the Roach Studios tournament, you can find that uh, reproduced in my blog. So just visit blogheads.com and look for the blog on Should Married Men Go Home. You know, I think that's a pretty good idea. You bet your life it's a good idea. Joining us today for his fourth time on the broadcast is the fabulous Glenn Mitchell. For those of you who may not know, Glenn is an internationally recognised authority on early cinema comedy, as well as a specialist in all forms of comedy, animation and music hall. He is the author of encyclopedias on Laurel and Hardy, Charlie Chaplin and the Marx Brothers, as well as the A to Z of silent film comedy. And not only that, he's a bloody nice bloke as well. So I'm very happy and excited to welcome Glenn Mitchell back to the Laurel and Hardy broadcast. Oh, thank you, Patrick. It's lovely to be back, and thank you for the kind words. Oh, it's well, it's all earned. It's all earned. In fact, I got most of it off the back of one of your books. <laughs> but it's uh, at last, it's, it's at, great to have you. At last, it's come in handy. Great, <laughs> <laughs> uh, fantastic. Um, you no, know, it's great to have you back, on. I've been looking forward to this because I've really enjoyed our previous chats uh, on the other films. Um, and so today, today we are looking at Should Married Men Go Home? Uh, it's the next film in the Laurel and Hardy canon um, as uh, a Stan and Babe film. Uh, so. Um, I think to start off with, it's probably worth uh, just mentioning that obviously Should Married Men Go Home is the first of the designated Laurel and Hardy series. Yes, it was. And um, it was, wasn't a distinction that audiences would recognise. It was purely in-house. But from that point on, yes, the Roach Studio decided this was the Laurel and Hardy series and not the All-Star series that they'd come out of. But uh, what I didn't know until Randy Scrippett did his massive update was that it wasn't originally intended to be. It had started off as an all-star entry. And this explains a small anomaly. Because if you look at the stills, they have the serial number has the S prefix for star rather than L for Lauren and Hardy. 
and I couldn't figure out why. But now I know it's because it started out as an all-star entry, but shifted to being Laurel and Hardy part way through. And so now we know. And uh, actually, thinking of stills, quite often with the production stills, you get a hint as, as to some gags that might have been shot but deleted. But with this one, I've only ever seen one that gives any suggestion of that. And I, and I still think this is a pose shot rather than anything else. And this is after the uh, outside the soda shop, which we'll come back to later. There's a pose with, uh, isn't it cigar boxes or something like that? Um, lots of them. And it, it's got the look of a just a pose silly gag thing rather than something that might actually have shot and deleted. So but I, I think that's the, say, the only thing in the stills that we don't necessarily see in the movie. The, the funny thing about it is that it, was, it became the first Laurel and Hardy comedy designated. And it was also the last one to come back amid all the ones that were known to exist up until the, the later discoveries in the 70s and so on after, right. after that. Of the ones that were known to exist as of mid to end of 60s, this was the last one they found, apparently. Oh, right. yeah, Richard Roberts told me this, I think. And apparently it came back in 1965. And I think that's why it wasn't used in Laurel and Hardy's Laughing Twenties. It was just too late for it. So Gunson didn't have access to it for that one. But he did use it two years later in The Further Perils of Laurel and Hardy. Right. Uh, I think it got in there in the it end. got it in the end. <laughs> and I think, yeah, I think it had come back just too late. But when, when it was found, Blackhawk Films immediately made it available to collectors on 16mm and 8mm and made a big thing of it, as you would expect them to. Um, but say so that's when it came back. So the first Laurel and Hardy proper was the last one to appear at the time. Fancy that. Mm. There we go. And, and and what do you think of Should Married Men Go Home, Glenn? Is it uh, is it one of uh, one that you would rate highly or I'd, fair to middling? It's it's a weird one because it's it's in a it's in the middle somewhat. Um, people tend to quote William K. Everson's comment on it um, about about being one of the best forgotten Laurel and Hardys, and it mm. being in the sort of in the middle rather. I think he was saying this more about their Purple Moment actually being sort of um, sort of <laughs> mid range, if you like, but yeah. I, th I think it suffers somewhat because of the number of routines in it that overlap with other films. Right. And yep. it's not the film's yep. fault because, the, because the variants tended to come later. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> so uh, yeah. you know, if you hadn't seen the, the, later, the later versions of those routines, you'd think, wow, this is wonderful. But I, yeah. I think now it's seen in comparison with the other occasions when they did those routines and did them better. Yes, yeah. Well, I mean, obviously, the dialogue it always helps massively, doesn't it, to, uh, to 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 the boys' films. Do you want, do you want to just talk a little bit about those um, the routines? Because there are, I mean, I, I can think of three off the top of my head, Glenn. Mm. I don't know if you've got any more than that, but uh, yeah. I think was it the, the first one, the uh, the one from Come Clean, where yes. um, St Stan's arriving? Is that the first one? Yeah, the uh, the Hardys do not want to see Mister Laurel. <laughs> <laughs> Pretend they're not in. <laughs> And, of course, Stan decides to write a note, put it under the door, and they make the mistake of pulling the note under the door. <laughs> and he's, <laughs> and he's still not bright enough to get what's going on or to be insulted by this. And, of course, eventually they, you know, it goes wrong and uh, they have to let him in. And, that, and, of course, they redid that in Come Clean. It's the Laurels. So what did you ask him here for tonight? I didn't ask him here tonight. I haven't seen them for two weeks. Well, you must have. They wouldn't come here uninvited. I tell you, I didn't invite them here. Don't lie to me, you big lunk. Don't you call me a lunk. Why, for two pens, I... <laughs> you pretend we're not home. Come on, come on. Can't you see they're not home? It's just as well I didn't want to come in the first place. Well, wait a minute. Better leave them a note. And a classic example of how they would embellish and improve. It's pretty much the same, except that in Come Clean, Stan, in writing the note, fails to realise he's autographed the wall that he's leaning on. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it's the extra touch, you know. <laughs> That's <laughs> really yeah. brilliant. Um, so the I do like... Uh, I, I noticed as well... Um, when when Stan's rapping on the door with with his golf, oh, top. he marks the door. 
he marks it, but it's already marked before he does it. Have you noticed? Which oh, obviously shows him that's not the first course. time he's done that. Yes, true. <laughs> not the first take. <laughs> or maybe it's, maybe it's just maybe it wasn't just the first time he called there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the marks from the previous visit. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's brilliant. And the the other one, um, the, the business in the soda fountain. Of course, they redid in Men of War. Um, yes. Yes. Again, not a new routine. Again, uh, a tip of the hat to Randy because he identified this as being an old vaudeville routine that Weber and Fields had done. Right. So it wasn't new when they did it, but again, they brought their own their own touch. And once again, their their remake of it in Men of War improves it and gives it the payoff that it never had in anybody's version. The business yes. about you know, drinking the whole glass because my heart was on the bottom. Do you know what you've done? What made you do it? I couldn't help it. Why? My hat was on the bottom. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and, it in- That's right. Yeah, and it improves on the way they come out of it and should married men go home because it's a bit of a limp ending to that stand. Uh, unable to pay the bill, leaves his watch to square the 30 cents. It was that kind of watch. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> that's, <laughs> yes. right. that's pretty funny, but but it's reliant on a title card, which you shouldn't necessarily have to do. And it's not a strong gag. Whereas, of course, in Men of War, uh, he rescues the situation by playing a, a fruit machine and, and wins, and gets him out of it, and goes on, therefore goes on to facilitate the next scene because they can pay to go on the boating league. But, to, but yes, I mean, should married men go home would seem a lot funnier to us now if we hadn't seen Come Clean and, and a War. That's right. And, of course, you have Charlie Hall as the soda duke. Yeah. Um, uh, which, I mean, I, and I love Charlie Hall, but, of course, compared to the way Finlayson plays the same character. Yes, yes. You know, there's so much that goes into that. I mean, I don't think he even has a word, does he, in, in no. a War? He just, it's just the looks. That's, that's what he doesn't really need to, to say much. Ch- no, Charlie Hall, sadly, good as he was, didn't really bring anything to that soda jerk role. Um, if, yeah. if you compare that to the equivalent role in Come Clean, the ice cream shop, you can see how much more yeah. he was bringing to it by then. But I think yes. in the early films he really yeah. wasn't. And, uh, but, and another parallel between uh, Paul and Finlayson taking equivalent roles, um, Chickens Come Home, the remake of Love and Weep. Yeah. Now, in Chickens Come Home, Finlayson is the butler, and he rings the last drop out of it, every possibility explored, and he's brilliant. In Love and yeah. Weep, the equivalent butler on is Charlie Hall, who might as well not be there. Yeah, gets to look, that's true. Could have been anybody. Yeah, he just yeah. gets to look stiff in one shot or something. Yeah. Um, so there's yeah. a parallel there, I think. And yeah, absolutely right. Yeah. So uh, the power of Finlayson, there's the power of that squint. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, Brilliant. The, the climactic fight actually itself, the mud fight, it's it's Battle of the Century revisited. They, it, was a, it was an obvious early Laurel and Hardy trademark, the big street battle. Um, mm. Battle of the Century, hats off, you darn toot, and all those. And you know, one, it's pies, one, it's hats, one, it's uh, trousers, and this one, it's mud. It's, it's a repeat of that motif. Yeah. So they were already repeating themselves a bit. And I think it's interesting that they really didn't go back to it very often after that. I mean, the, the who's, No, I was going to say, this is, seems to be the last one, I think, doesn't it, of that kind of... I mean, you've got two tars, which is on a similar thing, but I think it's a bit of an exception, two tars, because it's more to do with the vehicles than yeah. the fighting, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, and it's more to do with the, what Jack McCabe called reciprocal... Just can't even say it today. Reciprocal destruction. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. It has more in common with big business in that regard. But um, but but as regards the big street battles or outdoor battles, yeah, this was really the last one, uh, apart from the Who scale, which was an obvious attempt to do battle again. Uh, first yeah, time that's in- true. Yeah, it's an, it's interesting. They they decided to try and uh, reprise that kind of a battle in, in, in so far down the line. Yeah, yeah I, that's, that's I, good. I wonder if they wanted to see how it would work in sound. Mm, yeah. Oh, and there was there was one other uh, there was one other scene which um, the uh, the phonograph player. I was going to say that was one that. It was inherited rather than anything else from the previous film. Yeah. It was shot for and deleted from their purple moment. We got the still from That's it. That's right. So, That's um, right, yeah. So it almost, um, <laughs> it almost overlaps, but it does overlap in a sense, but audiences never saw the original. So, um, 
Yeah, but, yeah. It makes me smile because I didn't even think it was that good a gag, to be honest. No, not really. <laughs> I think if I'd have scratched it from one, I think I'd have left it scratched out, to be honest. <laughs> but uh, that's just me being miserable, I think. No, it, it's, it's, it's a mechanical gag. That's the point. Yeah. Their, their real strength was in character comedy punctuated by knockabout. I'm loath to say slapstick. Whereas, you know, pure mechanical gags, things that go boing, aren't really their forte. Yeah, and it, it's it's a it looks like a contrivance and is, and um, yeah. was generally what they did looked natural, and the turntable coming up the big spring going boing isn't natural. But so, but they were not, really not ones to to waste good ideas or sometimes bad ones, uh, usually good. Um, so yes, uh, this film inherited the cut gag from the purple moment, which probably should have stayed cut. Uh, but <laughs> but the record, the record itself. Stan wants to hear the Maiden's Prayer. Now, I was going to ask you if you know anything about that. Does anybody out there know? Because I do know that as a, as a tune, a composition, it had a kind of joke status. Okay. Yeah, um, it was a mid-19th century composition, which reportedly was written as a joke anyway, but one of those things that was written as a joke but became successful anyway. It does happen. Right. And um, I get the impression that it wasn't taken too seriously. And I... And I think it may have a lot to do with certain risque gangs about something being the answer to a maiden's prayer. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. yes. we must track this down. Yeah. So, the mere, so the mere reference to the title was enough to get a laugh, really, because of this, yeah. you know, because of the association with risque jokes. Now, if I'm completely, yeah, if I'm completely wrong about that, and I may, may well be, let us know, because I'd like to know, really. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, oh, well, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm somebody will be on like a rocket if they got some information. That'd be really interesting to find yeah. out. That's a, there's a challenge thrown down to the blockheads. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. Um, and uh, the also location as well. Just talk, thinking about the early the early golfing scenes as they arrive at the at the. Um, at the course, mm. I hadn't realised until fairly recently that a, a couple of the shots were actually, and some of the stills are, are outside the the, the Roach ad, admin um, buildings. Yes, yes, they are. I, I, I didn't twig for a long time either, but if you look out through the the windows of the soda fountain, you can see the the, the Roach admin building. If you know what to look for, yeah, yeah you yeah. can see it. And uh, yeah, they 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 just built a small set outside and. Um, that stood, you know, stood in as a soda fountain. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah. I've started. I've started to get quite um, a lot of pleasure out of spotting the the studio buildings in in various films. Yes, because um, once you once your eye is in, you could start to pick them up and see. You know, the the, the sort of the size of these kind of breeze block buildings on on certain areas, and um, I think there were some in uh, second hundred years. You know, and it, it's just really fascinating to see how they used that studio complex. Yeah, uh, not just the back lot. Yeah, it's fantastic. Absolutely, that those those large block bricks tell you that you're by the loading bay <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's what they used for the uh, for the set of the the miramar the ship with the gangplank oh that's right yeah, yeah that's walking right. through the loading yeah. bay apparently you're going on to the dock side the quay side but it's actually the loading <laughs> bay so yeah, <laughs> they didn't waste an inch of that place i'm sure of it yeah but yeah but, but yes the, the actual golf course um the name of the golf course now I've got some notes here which I've scarcely been looking at because I've, A, it's unwieldy. I've got a stack of them. <laughs> <laughs> and B, with a lot of this, if you pull a string in my back, off I go. So, <laughs> uh, but the thought of the string just broken. But uh, let's see, I, I wrote down, I can't remember the name of the golf course. Well, I've got, maybe I can possibly help you please, out there. Please, I, actually scri I scribbled a couple of notes down earlier on. Um, and from what I can make out, there was two golf courses used. Mm. The Fox Hills Golf That's Course was the thinking. first. Yeah. Fox Hills, yeah, uh, which was which was four miles south of the Roach uh, Roach Studios. Uh, th again, this is thanks to Randy Scrabbit yeah. because most things are <laughs> um, the Fox Hills Golf Course. And then, f and then for some reason, um, they uh, for the last two days of filming um, and also coming back for retakes, they went to the Westwood Public Golf Course. Um, mm. And that was something to do with, if memory serves me now, something to do with the guy that owned the Westwood public golf course was a friend of Hal Roach. Um, and it was obviously going to be cheap or free to use it. And also it would be great publicity for the golf course to have a, a Hollywood movie shot um, on their course on the links. So um, yeah. Yeah. Well, that, yeah, that all ties together. Um, again, uh, we owe this to Randy's credit. 
the Fox Hills Golf Course is now a shopping mall. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. That's to right. which I can only say, well, it would be, wouldn't it? It would be, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah no surprise there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but um, it was it overlooks um, some sort of uh, oil field. You can see the, the old derricks in the background. Oh, the derricks, that's right, yes. Yeah, it's not the most picturesque of golf courses, was it? Not really, and, and as, you know, as golf houses go, I should think they'd be fairly challenging. <laughs> you know, get the ball off the top of that thing if you can. I'm not at all sure there actually aren't pools of oil amid all the mud, actually. That's another story. <laughs> I mean, it looks more like oil than mud. It does. Um, and I just, uh, the, the other thing I was going to mention to you as well, uh, Glenn, I'll ask you about, was the um, the home movie oh, that was yeah. made, just thinking about the, the old Derricks and things. Yeah, um, George Mann. Yeah, what, what can you tell us about that one, Glenn? Because that's a really fascinating little insight. It, it really is. It was a wonderful thing um, and generously shared. Um, we, we owe access to this film by Brad Smith, who posted it online back in 2012. Um, the, the film had been taken by his father, George Mann, who was half of a vaudeville comic dance act called Barto and Mann, um, who were active between the 20s and the 40s. And uh, over the years, George Mann took a phenomenal number of photographs and shot a huge amount of 16 millimeter film. All the places he traveled to, he would take the cameras with him. And uh, Brad Smith's wife, Diane Woods, looked in their basement and found the collection. You know, which, which is wonderful. And she took the trouble, time and trouble to digitize the whole lot. Wow. Yeah. And then with enormous generosity, they shared it with the world on YouTube. It was wonderful. Wow. And, That's amazing. Yeah. And I, I think she did it in part so that George Mann's significance as a great American photographer would be recognized and appreciated, which right, great motive. But, um, but yes, yeah, yeah. a wonderful thing to do. And uh, the, thing, the reason that George Mann got access to the filming location was that his dance teacher had been a guy called Roy Randolph, who apparently is in it, is in the film. Um, he'd, he'd owned um, and ran Randolph's, I've got, I've got a note of the name here, uh, Randolph's La Monica Dance School, which is in Santa Monica. Right. And he obviously had some sort of long-term association with Lauren and Hardy, even though I don't really know anything about him, because... I remember seeing a photograph taken some years later of him with at least Stan Laurel, if not Laurel Ann Hardy. I think it was some, some okay. function or other someplace. I forget what it was. Um, I think it was among the many stills, among the extras, on that recent-ish definitive restoration set. Do you remember it? Right. Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, the, yeah. The, the loads of photographs. I think there's one of Roy Randolph in there from years after this. So he must have had some sort of long-term friendship with them right okay i'll have to look out for that I mean, it doesn't uh yeah it doesn't ring any bells at the minute but there's there's so many photographs on that uh those blue rays <laughs> i'm still working my way through oh, them to be honest yes i mean it's, it's a wonderful collection there's so much to look through yeah. but uh, but, a, yeah. but a, yeah apparently randolph's in this and that he was probably the, the means by which george mann got access and um i've made uh, made some notes here roughly who we see and at the big, well, the big, beginning of it, it's Roy Randolph, apparently, with various women. He's, he's do, doing some comic canoodling, and they're fighting over it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. and, uh, there's, there's one of them is feigning jealousy and grabbing him off the other other woman, and so on. The I recognise the woman in the plaid outfit who is in the film. It's Clara Gill, who was the oh, yeah right. the sister of Fred Gill, director. And she plays quite a few roles. I didn't realise yeah, that. Yeah, it's, it's her. So is, is she, she isn't the one that pulls that funny face? No, no. That's somebody else. That's somebody okay, else. Say. And that, that's another point I was actually oh, going right. to come to. It's, it's oh, strange yeah, a bit. Yeah. But, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. But Clara Gill, you know, she, she's in. Um, she's one of the waitresses in their purple moment. And you'll see her, you'll right. see her as the, the secretary yeah. in Chickens Come Home. And she plays all sorts of parts. But, yeah, so um, so we've got so we've got that opening bit. And then we get then we see Laurel and Hardy. Um, you know, babe hitting Stan in the face with a golf club on his back swing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, that's, oh, thinking of, thinking of Hardy's swing, another point that Randy made is that for all the, the golfing aspect, and the film was inspired by Babe's love of golf, at no point in the film do you actually see Babe Hardy's famous swing. He never really plays properly on in the film, which is, I don't know whether no. by accident or design, he didn't want to <laughs> give anything away, I don't know. <laughs> but, but anyway, back to the home movie. Um, Yes, we see George Mann holding Viola Richard. I have no comment to make. Holding her from behind and chatting. 
Yes, he's very familiar, very, isn't he? He gets quite familiar. Very tactile, yeah. I thought. Yeah, um, <laughs> tactile. That's yeah, the word. <laughs> different time. He tried it. No, he'd be in real trouble. I think. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. But anyway, but we see then we see Lauren and Hardy on the girls and the girls on the golf course, pretty much as in the movie. Stan keeps missing the yeah. ball, hits Holly on the shin. Ollie gets angry and Stan walks off to left. And that's pretty much as, as we see in the film. Um, yeah. Then you see some, some closer shots of Laurel and Hardy with George Mann, the shaking hands. Um, they're demonstrating how to make Stan cry by hitting his jaw, <laughs> how to bring him back to a grin in the same manner. And, and then they try this amongst each other. But yes, uh, George Mann looks on as Babe carries a girl on each shoulder. He was big enough and strong enough to do it. Uh, on one shoulder, he's got Viola Richard. Now, the other one, now here's the, the thing I was, I was going to pick up on. I'm not sure who the other girl is because she's been identified as Dorothy Coburn, who is in the film. But it, to me, it, it doesn't look like her facially. Um, she look, To me, she looks more like Martha Sleeper, who was still around, I think, at the studio then because she was working with Max Davidson in 1928. Um, but I'm not sure if she was there then, and I don't think she's in the movie itself. So but it looks, facially, looks far less like Dorothy Coburn than Martha Sleeper. But if anybody... Yeah, that's not, that's not Dorothy Coburn. No. There's no, no, no way. No, no. No, no so... No, I, yeah, I don't, I don't recognise her, I must admit, but uh, she's very prominent in the, in the, um, in the clip. But because, mm. uh, as I say, she comes quite sort of close to the camera and pulls that uh, funny face, doesn't she, at the, the, uh, yes. the camera? Yeah, and yeah. That, that doesn't look like Dorothy Coburn, but... I'm not 100% sure it looks like Martha Sleeper either, but it's more like Martha Sleeper than Dorothy Coburn. <laughs> yes, that's but right. Again, constructive suggestions welcome, please. Um, yeah, yeah. But anyway, then we see George Mann with Babe and the giant John Arzen, mm. who was yeah. on what you believe was either, what, what was he supposed to be, eight foot nine or something, but was more likely, <laughs> more likely about seven foot two if you, you know. yeah. either way, he's pretty big. <laughs> and, and he's he's known from the Harold Lloyd picture Why Worry, and he's also in one or two of the Charlie Chases and at least one hour gang. But um, yeah, actually, he was um, uh, he was shooting um, concurrently with our gang on Growing Pains ah. at the same time that this uh, Should Married Man Go Home was being filmed, yeah. um, and yeah. actually in the same location on the same day. Uh-huh. Um, they, I, was, I was just reading it again. I'm sure this is in Randy's book uh, on Motor Avenue in Culver City. The the shot where Stan is walking down the street to get to the Hardys' house. Yes. That apparently is Motor Avenue, mm. um, and and our gang were filming with John um, Arson. Is it Arson? Is that you say? Um, I'm 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 a shit. Ar- Arson. I'll probably a soft S. Arson. I, Arson. Arson. Let's say Arson. It doesn't sound as rude. No, not is it? quite. Um, <laughs> but then again, why should we sacrifice a cheap laugh? I mean, why? <laughs> That's true enough. Yeah. Then the farmer came in and he shot the traveling salesman. Oh, how dare you! <laughs> that's but, true. Uh, it was Norwegian, I think, or something like that. So, you that's know, right. I, I, I have no great grasp of Scandinavian pronunciation. So, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, in this bit, he's holding up Babe's golf cap, um, possibly with the golf ball in it, and the um, the, the dancer and the about six foot six tall George Mann. He tries to high kick yeah. the ball into the air, and I, whether he entirely succeeds isn't clear. But he's doing his best. And it's a huge stretch of leg. <laughs> It's very impressive. Yeah. It's very impressive. It really is. Yeah. It brings tears to the eyes, doesn't yeah. it? Oh, yes. It, <laughs> yes. I'll draw a veil across that. But, yes, I mean, <laughs> terrible. But, yeah. And so then we get a quick shot of Stan and Edgar Kennedy. And back to George Mann wrangling with the mystery girl, who we, we agree is not Dorothy Coburn. Um, yeah. Then we've got Stan and Edgar Kennedy, the, the divot toupee gag. Again, pretty much as you see it in the film. I, th- I think Mann may well have been photographing that slap bang next to the main cameras it could possibly yeah possibly unless unless they just decided to just muck around but do something that they were they were practicing at the time perhaps yeah, yeah. as you say it's, it's almost like, like for like shot for shot isn't it yeah, yeah. Well, thinking of cameras and i of course it's plural the ropes were shooting camera a camera b still domestic and overseas something you'd like to come yeah. back to about that and about what survived but um oh okay but anyway yeah um brilliant but yes, well, where were we? Oh yes, here now here I, I can't pretend to have known this. The uh, the YouTube upload very kindly and helpfully gave us the names of the people they knew about and recognised. And I would never have known this. But but apparently next we see Rochelle Dalolio of the of the Dino and Rochelle dance team sitting in a chair. Right. Yeah, so that's okay. Rochelle Do- 
Dolio, try again. Followed followed by Dina Lalolio of the Dina and Rochelle dance team wearing a suit. Uh, Rochelle again uh, sitting in a chair. Um, unknown male shirtless and Roy Randolph again. So there we go. Um, this is followed by shots of some sort of engine. I have no idea what it is. Um, for all I know, it could be an industrial freezer. It's gigantic. I don't know. I can't, I can't help on that one. No, no. I, um, I think I've I think I've just looked at the condensed version. There's, there's a slightly shorter version online as well, yeah, isn't there? Yeah, there is. Um, um, what they did, they, they put up the, the, the edited highlights first and then gave us the whole lot. So... Uh, so this is uh, spare, sparing us the engine first time, though. but but <laughs> but here we are back to what you were saying really about the streets, the locations. Because here next we've got George Mann walking around the back lot New York Street set. Oh yes, I have seen that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah looking yeah. into the shop windows and rounding a corner, feigning concern, <laughs> running, and then sees the, <laughs> then sees the back of a set that's been mounted above street level, above the first floor or something. And yeah. looking concerned for reasons unknown. <laughs> <laughs> and then we're back to the loading bay as George Mann walks up the gangplank of the Nomar. Ahoy. And, uh, and, they, and they give the game away by panning the camera across to far right so we see where the ship set ends. Right, yes. Yeah, yes. This, this is where the rails finish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it's it's a great insight though, isn't it, into the into the behind the scenes, um, at the you know, on the lot and uh, on the golf course and everything. It's just a, it's just a lovely, lovely insight. You don't get that at all, do you? apart from the yeah. that's that uh, film that had Stan uh, was made for his birthday. Yes. You don't see any beside, behind the scenes, any outtakes. It's just such a rarity, um, which makes it so wonderful to see. Yes, um, so little. I think what what I should do, I'll put I'll put a link in the podcast show notes so that any listeners who haven't seen mm. it uh, can click on it and and, and watch it because it is it's well worth taking just a few minutes to to watch. Oh, that. really? It's, it's about six and a half minutes and a very good investment of six and a half minutes. Believe me, it's wonderful. Yeah. Can't recommend yeah. it highly enough. And. Uh, yeah. But having uh, having given the game away with the Miramar only going so far to the right, we we see George Mann again dancing and hamming it up with Charlie Chase, which is great fun. Um, yeah. Somebody who I don't know, a man called Henry Connor, who seems to be teasing a cat. <laughs> yeah, fine, you know, if you want to do that, well, you know. Um, I know then, That's all that social media is about nowadays. Well, <laughs> yes, we can't move for cat videos, really. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, how many of them are actually teasing? Them? I have no idea because I, would, I wouldn't look. But uh, um, why, no, why should I care? I'm not a member of the Cats Union, so I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> but having having paused unnecessarily with Mr. Connor and a Moggy, we then see the main studio building exterior, which is always nice to see. And uh, no, it's not there anymore, sadly. So good to see it. And presumably, just outside that building, it ends with a. a a generic advertising poster for the Laurel and Hardy films. Yeah, that's it. Uh, Which again, is, this, is that one where Stan's, this is like Stan's face in a circle. And yeah, I think so. Ba- Babe's face seems to be missing. I don't know why. There's a, like a blank circle next to yeah, it. Yeah, I couldn't quite make it out because um, I, I kept hoping they might you know, pull back to reveal a bit more, but they don't. So I, I can't answer yeah. that one. But the fact that there is a poster now outside the studio promoting the Laurel and Hardy films ties back mm, to yeah. this one having become the first and the official designated series. So I imagine that was a new poster to commemorate the occasion. Yeah. I would imagine. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they were obviously putting their uh, their full force behind the team at this point. Mm, very much so, yeah. yes. And the yeah. well, you know, the, the contemporary press sheets uh, give you a good idea of that as well. Yeah. It's been a, no, really right. getting behind them. So That's right. And and we were talking just a bit ago about the stills as well. And I do you remember there's a lot of stills showing a, a, a range of ladies in the golfing attire. Mm. Um, nothing really to do with with the action and the films. Um, we've got Viola Richard there, Edna Marine, of course, Dorothy Coburn, and then there's you know a, a quite a number of other ladies that I don't recognise at mm. all. Yeah. Um, uh, Edna Marion, I thought um, we, it, it, this is this is probably our last chance to talk about Edna Marion before she disappears from the Laurel and Hardy scene. Yes, certainly. Um, because it, as I understand it, bef- just just prior to filming, um, Viola Richard, Edna Marion, uh, and I think Dorothy Coburn as well, all had their contracts terminated or they were notified they were about to be terminated. Yes, one of Roach's um, periodic economy drives, and 
periodic bad decisions, frankly, because he lost a lot of very talented women that way. He really did. He, yeah. he, those three were wonderful. And you, yeah. you, you kind of wonder why he thought that was Deadwood that should go rather than somebody else. Yeah. Because they, they'd, yeah. done, they'd done such good work there and could have continued to do so. And even more baffling, not too long after that, he hired Gene Harlow. Yeah. Um, you know, who was also very good, but why bother? Why not just keep who you've got, who you've got, and who you know is good? Um, I don't know. And of course, he had to lose Gene Harlow anyway because the fa her family objected to the double whoopee disrobing. Uh, he was, she was, yeah, she was very happy at the studio, wants to continue, but I think it was a grandfather or something. He said, no, you're leaving there. And it was because she'd been hoiked out by granddad that Hal Roach hired Thelma Todd. So there's a sort of a, a thread here, but um, but yeah, I I really don't know what why Roach did that. I'm sure he could have saved a few bucks by something a little less destructive. But but, but the fact remains that the, that the three of them did did get the heave ho at that point, and uh, all credit to them for see, managing to seem bright and amusing despite the fact they knew they were going. I would say it was inexplicable. <laughs> So yeah, so um, so if we if we have a little talk about Edna Marion, I think as I say, this is the last chance we've got to just to, um, have a little focus on. Mm. We've, we've looked at Viola Richard before on a previous episode, and also Dorothy Coburn, um, and I think um, yeah, it's it's time we just paid a little bit of tribute to to Edna Marion. What can you uh, what can you tell us about Edna? Blair? Well, for one thing, before I get into any biographical details, um, before she joined Hal Roach, she was in uh, comedies with Al Christie. Christie comedies and I have to say she got a lot more to do there she really did get involved she'd be playing the wife of comics like um, Eddie Barry um, what's the other guy's name has just gone out of my head um, this is silly but you know this never come back but she was getting far more involved in the general action and in the plot moving in the Christie comedies and got a lot of the physical stuff to do as well and uh, Neil Burns that was the other name People, comics like Neil Burns and Eddie Barry and she really was integral to, to the goings-on. But at Hal Roach, she seemed rather less so. Charlie Chase used her more than Laurel and Hardy did. She, she would be Mrs. Chase and she would have a role, or she'd be the future Mrs. Chase, as in Limousine Love. But she's, but she's still, in that one, she's still very much second female lead after Viola Richard, who gets the real action. Yeah, you know, she's the naked girl in the back of the car. Edna Marion is the ever more annoyed, frustrated bride to be waiting for Charlie. So again, even though Chase did tend to use her more constructively, wasn't as good as as when she was at Christie. She had far more to do. And Lauren and Hardy had her there, but she doesn't get to be a lot more than decorative by and large. I feel, and and that's, and that's unusual for them because generally they would spot something in people and use it. Um, yeah, yeah. She was. I'm trying to think how many films. I've got a list of about three, three films. Sugar Daddies, From Soup to Dots, Should My Man Go Home, obviously, yeah. um, and she, oh, now I'll tell one, obviously, but she's a Charlie Chase yeah. film. But the boys just happened to be in, um, and then Flying Elephants. Obviously, she's in a lot of stills uh, for Flying Elephants, but not in the movie. But um, but not in the movie, no. Which is a shame because yeah. he could have done with a bit of something. Well, else. Well, yes, but that, <laughs> again, she really didn't get the opportunities with them. But but anyway, but she, but I do. I, I wonder, frankly, if if the move to Roach was no more, I think, for her than Prestige. It was a step up from Christie. But in, t yes. in terms of but yeah, that's a good. Point. Yeah, but in terms of on-screen opportunities, it was a definite step down, as far as I'm concerned. I've seen some of them, and she's yeah. a, a lot busier in them. It's a lot more to do, yeah. but anyway. But, uh, but yes, by, but grad biographical details. When, when back in the, the dark pre-internet pre age, I started to put together the Laurel and Hardy Encyclopedia. This isn't a plug, honestly. Uh, <laughs> plug away, it's fine. <laughs> the, uh, the, the, there were a few people for whom biographical details were scant, to say the least, and she was really one of them. I think Randy had some details in his original edition of his book gave us a bit more but i was looking for things like dates and birthplace and um, there was a book a rather obscure reference volume and a rather old one in the now defunct study room of the theater museum in london 
it's actually it was actually the V and A Theatre Collection. And when they had a separate theatre museum, there was a study room you could go to, and they had all manner of very obscure books. And I cannot remember which one of this was, but it had something about Edna Marion and where she was born, when, and what her real name was. And it was close, but not 100% accurate, as it turns out. But it was a little-known volume from way back where somebody had pieced together the story as best they could. It was a general, general sort of directory. And I think there was some uncertainty over the original surname, but we now know that their actual surname, we're pretty much sure that it was Hannam, H-A-N-N-A-M, Hannam, and um, born on the 12th of December, 1906. Now, I think what I'd got at the time was born in 07, but I think that was based on the fact that she died at the end of 1957 at the age of only 50. But she hadn't quite made, I shouldn't chuckle, but, you know, it was, one of those things where it gets vague. Um, laugh would be vague to such a small distinction, if you like. Um, you know, she was that. Uh, she she actually uh, died on the second of December '57, and it was uh, about a, you know, a week short of her birthday. So, uh, but actually born in 1906, and she had pneumonia. And oh, grief. yeah, which it, it, it happens. People can pass away of pneumonia at any age. Yeah. But I wonder if, and, but, but at 50, it's still a relatively early death, even at that time. And I think this might have been the long term effects of a serious illness she'd actually had in the 20s. Oh, really? Yeah, I, I don't remember why I read this, but um, she'd had a, a very, very nasty turn, a, a close brush with death in the, when she was oh, yeah. only, you know, the 21 or something like that. And I wonder if she'd been left with a predisposition. To illness, which is why she didn't live that long. That you know, just the long-term effects of that seemingly overcome, but obviously serious illness in the twenties. I think that's why she didn't you know, didn't survive. But very sad. But um, but yeah, her father was English, one John Hannon, and her mother was an Ele Eleanor McLaughlin of uh, Indiana, Indiana. Was it, it? So that's what we know about the parentage. Height five foot one, eyes blue. There's a song there, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but apparently um, she began in films in 1924. Um, Broadway Beauties Century Films released the Universal, and over a period of eight years appeared in 56 films. And uh, there's not a lot I can add to this. She did get quite a, a splurge in the moving picture world of the 21st of May 1927. Where they made rather a thing of um, Roach having having signed her. Uh, Hal, Hal Roach has Edna Marion under contract, so she was obviously a familiar enough name to warrant this sort of coverage. Yeah, yeah, I noticed that myself actually, Glenn. Yeah, it was quite a, a prominent, yeah, prominent thing for her to be moving. Yeah. yeah. So um, she, you know, she was sufficiently well known, and they obviously saw it as a career step up. Um, yeah, another beauty has been added to the roster of long-term contract players at the Hal Roach Studios in the person of Edna Marion, that's what it says. And, uh, and according to this, it was, it was through Charlie Chase. Uh, Charlie Chase, one of Roach's comedy stars, selected Miss Marion as his leading lady in his latest Pathé production, just completed and not yet titled. Now, I, I think that may have been a, an assumption, I don't know. But then again, no, it would have to have been... Had to have been now I'll tell one, which you mentioned earlier on, which was a pathé. Um, so, yes, so that does fit. Um, May the 21st, 1927. So, just at the tail end of the pathés, but she was around for the change over to MGM. And uh, so, yes, now I'll tell one, followed by assistant wives. Then we've got Flying Elephants, Sugar Daddies, and Charlie Chase's The Sting of Stings, which does get a bit more to do in. The Lighter That Failed, which I don't think is around. Uh, the Way of All Pants, which come back in a condensed form, light of it because of what Junk's used, um, and, and so on. So, uh, but yes, that's that's Edna Marion, and she was you know, she was delightful. I just wish she'd got more to do at Hal Roach because in the in, in the, yeah. the Christie comedies, she really did spark far more in the yeah. opinion. Do you know what she did after Roach then? When when, when once Roach had let her go, I think she quit. Um, the there, there's there's something about her. Having been uh, at the time of her death, being listed as a housewife, she she married a guy called 
uh, Harold, Na Harold Naisbit, and had left, just left the business. Oh, what a yeah. shame. That is a shame. Yeah, it's an enormous pity. Um, just, just went to waste, as so many did. Um, um, yes, think, thinking of the, the Marion connection, Edna Marion to Marion Byron, yeah, who, who did lovely things at Hal Roche and very funny. And she, she got the chop at about the same time as the others, I think, or shortly after. Um, they decided, decided that the, the shorts in which she was paired with Anita Garvin weren't working, which was silly because they'd only done three. And they, on the third one, it worked. They just got it right, and then they decided to pull the series. Another wonderfully inexplicable decision at Road Studios. And so from there, from there, Mar Marion Byron really you know, didn't do anything there, but she, she crops up in some talky features at the big studios in featured roles, and she's very good, but it never really went anywhere. And by, uh, by about 1934, she's playing switchboard operators and uh, and from then on she doesn't really do an awful lot and she she finished up marrying a screenwriter lou breslow who wait for it wrote great guns <laughs> yes of course yes of course <laughs> it's a small world yeah see so you kind of wonder while he was writing that not so wonderful script for laurel and hardy at fox whether when they were Confer when Laura and Hardy were talking to him, and I think they must have done because at least one photograph. Um, whether they ever said, How's the missus? <laughs> yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah, it's a good point, isn't it? Yeah, I could imagine they would. Do. I mean, Stan always seemed to be very um, um, interested and concerned about his you know previous associates, um, mm. whether it be for musical or you know, uh, previous films. So, yeah, I would have thought they would. Have I, done. I think they, prob they probably would have met up, you know, had a coffee or something, and because uh, they, they both like that. I mean, um, Babe Hardy for the second Fox picture of Horny we Go. The, the cameraman, he got the cameraman that job. It was a guy he'd known long before. And things like that. And um, so they, they were both like that. I mean, you, um, say, as we know, you know Stan's old friends like, like Baldwin Cook from Vaudeville would turn up in the Roach films. And, and Babe Hardy was the same. Um, you know, Faye Holden is playing Mrs. Hardy here and there. She was with him in the Billy West films in 1918. <laughs> yeah, that sort of thing. That yeah, people like Babe London who recurred, and um, uh, Billy Bletcher, of course, went back, back to that period as well with uh, with Hardy. So, uh, so yeah, they, they were they were they were great like that in in in, in keeping these long term friendships and, and getting them a job if they could. They were, yeah, they were, and of course, Viola turned up again in in um, uh, tip tip tap, tap. A, doing a walk past, kind of a walk on yeah. part. Yeah, so. Yeah, although I've still, I still never spotted her. I still don't, I, have no idea which one I she haven't. is. No, I've tried. <laughs> in good prints and bad. <laughs> yeah, strange. Yeah. Again, we'll, we'll throw that out there. If anybody can tell us which one is my whole Richard and Tit for Tat, I'd love to. Yeah, yeah, please tell uh, us. Because I've never, I, I've never spotted her, but I, uh, we have it on good authority that she was there. So Yeah, so you know, who are we to argue? But um Oh, the, the other the other little snippet I was going to just throw in there because it, this was something that I had no idea what it meant, and I've read it so many times. Um, Edna Marion was um, voted a wampus baby star, and I, th I had no idea. And I've read this about a few. Who, what the hell is a wampus baby star? <laughs> now I know. I, mean, I don't know if you can explain, but I, I went <laughs> went over to Wikipedia yeah. of all pa of all places to find out what what a wampus yeah. baby star is. It was, so, yeah, the wampus was an acronym. For an industry organisation, I can't remember the full name. Um, I, I can. Please it's tell the me. Western Association of Motion Picture Advertisers. There we are. Thank you. I can never remember that. Womp. Yeah, and, <laughs> uh, and they had this thing where they would nominate those who uh, actresses specifically who they thought were going places. Each, each yeah. year they would they would name these Wampus Baby stars, you know, the ones to look out for in the future. And I think she got that in what nineteen twenty five. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've got I've got a, a very brief list of other of other stars: um, Clara Bow in twenty four, Janet Gaynor, Fay Ray, Dolores Del Rio, Mary Astor in twenty six, Joan Crawford twenty six, Lupita Velez nineteen twenty eight, um, and Ginger Rogers in nineteen thirty two. Mm. So um, yeah, quite a few actually did go places. There, it wasn't a guarantee, but uh, but they they were actually very good at spotting future stars. Actually, they had a good batting average. 
Yes, uh, she was voted a Wampus Baby Star of 1926. Oh, who am I to argue with me? She was known to have entered films at least two years earlier in the Stern Brothers' Century Comedies. There we go. From Glenn Mitchell's A to Z of silent film comedies. And thank you, Glenn Mitchell, for allowing me to uh, to read from that. <laughs> my from my your... pleasure. Well, I, 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 I typed that back in the mid-90s. So, uh, <laughs> and since I sometimes think, what was I doing Tuesday? Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's right, yeah. I can sympathise with that. <laughs> oh, yeah. So, so thus, anyway, the somewhat sad story of um, Edna Marion, who deserved, deserved far better. Yes, uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And the, the other interesting thing, I think we mentioned just slightly before, uh, Should Married Men Go Home was filmed just before the um, the break, the Hal, when Hal Roach Studios shut down. Um, and as Randy again um, describes in the book, Babe Hardy went on holiday together with... George, not George Stevens, James Parrott and... Oh, they went up to Canada. That's right, yeah, was it Vancouver? Yeah, yes. Yeah, and there's, there's these beautiful photographs of, uh, of Jim, Jimmy Parrott and Babe um, enjoying some uh, some, some Yeah, booze. legal booze. <laughs> yes. Legal yes. booze. No, no yeah. prohibition in Canada, of course. And dangerously, of course, Myrtle Hardy also went as well. Ah, so uh, yeah. that would be interesting. Yep. Yep, sadly. With all that booze flying around, yeah. so he must have uh, had to keep a tight, uh, a tight rein. Do you think? On her. Do you think it was a problem for her that early, though, or maybe something that happened? Oh yeah, really? yeah, yeah, yeah. She was uh, at that time. Yeah, she was already struggling with, with the alcoholism. Oh boy. Um, and uh, yeah, it wasn't too far down the road. I don't think when uh, things started to go really sour. Mm. But yeah, but at this point, um, the alcoholism is already proving a little bit, you know, a bit of a problem for them, for them both. Bless well, that's them. Sad, isn't it? But yes, yeah, so probably not the best place to have gone. We could pass by the stuff legally and openly, but uh... <laughs> not, not really. No, not really. Um, any any final thoughts um, on on should married men go home? I, I, on my notes, I've just got uh, the George Stevens is tracking shots again. Um, tracking Stan down the street and of course on the golf course as well where Stan's picking up the, the golf yes. balls <laughs> which is a lovely oh, game that's something that actually Peter Nicholson alerted me to because something never seemed quite right about that in as much as um, that shot tended to be misplaced in available copies and uh, the, uh, the, the the Michael A.G. Lost Films version put it right <laughs> But the prints that were around for years, I think this probably comes from the Blackhawk prints, and it certainly applies to the to the eight millimeter print I picked up in the mid seventies, which is the first time I saw it properly. Because uh, the first time I saw anything of, of Should Married Men Go Home was when I caught up with the Further Perils compilation, slightly belatedly. It came out in sixty seven. I didn't see it at the time. I don't think it got much of a distribution. It played in the West End briefly, then disappeared. I think, but it turned up on TV in nineteen seventy two. And th- that's when I first saw any of uh, Should Married Men Go Home. And I managed to get a, a complete, say complete, eight millimeter print of it about, about three years after that, I suppose. But um, but I, something didn't sit right. And this this scene with the, the picking up the golf balls was in the wrong place. Um, I'm just, just consulting what Peter wrote about this. Um, it says, this shot comes after Stan has been knocked to the ground by Edgar Kennedy's golf club. In the European versions I've seen, it's placed right after the leave the soda shop, and that is wrong. So, right. so in, in the, the modern American copies, it's in the right place, but in the European copies, the DVDs are still in the wrong place. And I think that's right, inherited okay. from Blackhawk. And um, okay. so, this this takes us back actually to what I was saying earlier about the the nature of the material that came back in 1965. Uh, yeah. It's quite possible it may not even have been. Um, completely assembled maybe they had to reassemble it slightly i don't know yeah and that's how, yeah. that, how that's got moved but um mm. but what it does have is what they call flash titles now i think we've we've been over this previously or somebody would have done but it was about the practice of not keeping the intertitles permanently inserted in the, in the negative they oh, know, okay they, they, they would keep say flash titles because there's only one one two one or two, two or three frames of it left. They weren't permanently left in there. The reasons, I think, varied. One of them, I think, was the fact that the the, the, the stock was of lesser quality, was more likely to deteriorate and affect the surrounding footage. That's one explanation. Oh, okay. Uh, the rest yeah. of it may be economy, but they always felt that, okay, we've got a note of what the titling is. We can always make it up again should we want to make new prints. 
but this uh, this with the original titling is only in flash frames and some of them miss are missing completely in the original um mm -hmm. we've seen uh freeze frames of things like the main title so i think the cast title is probably missing but but the main title director title credits there as flash frames but some of the intertitles had disappeared um, but never reinstated um the worst attempt I think I ever saw at, at remaking the typing was an old TV print that it looked like they, they'd made up the new titling with one of those rather primitive home movie titling sets. You know, this <laughs> you know, stick on letters. It was absolutely <laughs> terrible. It looked really well. And further, they, they, they committed the sin of inserting a fabricated title, but all the actor says here is another fine mess. I think it does say fine, I'm not sure. I'm not sure it's not fine or nice, but either way, that catchphrase right. did not yet exist. And, and, the, and, and where he says it in the film doesn't even make sense necessarily either. It's, <laughs> it's, it's not an appropriate reaction to what's going on. Right. <laughs> but, um, oh but yeah, so, um, so that was probably the worst retitling of, I, I've seen. But, um, but some, of them, some of them were missing. And the most noticeable example is when they're on the golf course, Stan's trying to hit the ball. And we cut to um, Ollie and Egg Kennedy, and Kennedy asks Ollie, what system does he use? Ollie replies, but it's just a splice and a jump, so we don't get the answer. Oh. <laughs> and that's how it was. That's how it was in print for years. It wasn't the only casualty. Um, we lost some in the soda sequence as well, which obscured a bit of the meaning as to what was going on, like we could follow it. But this one, we never got the answer. And there was one print, and I don't remember which one it was, which had a stand but providing an answer and Ollie says so he uses the metric system <laughs> which, which is quite good actually I think it's a pretty good gag yeah that'll do that'll do <laughs> but, the, uh, but the actual gag is uh, no system he plays by ear which is even better and that's <laughs> And that's yes. more H. N. Walker work. That's Beanie Walker, Walker work. Yeah. There. And, that's uh, good. But it, eventually, I think, I think, please tell me there are some copies that put them all back. But, but what I find incredible is that when there were previous people were having a go at putting the typing back, nobody looked at the cutting continuity because they're all in there. Yeah, I was going to say. Again, for any, any new listeners, all zero of you, um, <laughs> <laughs> this was a printed, typed up, shot by shot record of everything that happens in the film including all the titling all the dialogue typed up so it, i think it was done to uh, facilitate the maintenance of the negatives or something so but but they but they exist and they give us the text of all the titling so there's really no excuse not to know what they're saying in these missing title cards but um but yeah that's but that was what we got back um, a negative with with flash titles in and uh, and I, I can't make up my mind whether it was camera A or camera B, which camera A for domestic would have been George Stevens, and camera B for overseas and specifically Britain was Hal Roach's brother Jack on camera B. And um, some of the close ups, particularly when they first meet the girls, look a bit like second best facial angles, which you tend to get on camera B. But the remaining titles in, in the flash frames have that sort of uh, textured background cloth of stone or leather or whatever. Um, whereas I've noticed that the material for, for the UK, for some reason, has titling that's white on black, intertitling white on black rather than textured. Oh, right. So I'm inclined to think it is, right. is camera, but some of the angles are surprisingly not so good <laughs> for, for the domestic edition. So... Um, but then again, it may have, been, may have had to be pieced together for more than one because they did that with the finishing touch, I think. I think they, they cobbled together camera A and B for that. I've certainly seen, I've certainly seen A and B material on it. And yeah, I think yeah, in, yeah. In, in one instance, at least, it looks like mostly one, but bits of the other. But uh, I'm sure there's somebody out there who tell me I'm quite wrong. So. Well, we might be surprised, and it might be George Mann on the camera. <laughs> <laughs> we won't be using his footage. <laughs> well, you never know. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so, um, so, yes, I mean, that's, um, that's, that's something for speculation or somebody who knows more <laughs> to tell us. Yeah. So, um, but, yeah, I think we are probably getting to pretty much to the end of what there is to be said about this. Um, I'm having a very good look or rather myopic peer, I should say, 
Uh, so, so see if there's anything of relevance. I think the the only sort of the overriding um, feeling that I have having having rewatched it again, it, there doesn't seem to be. You thought they would have done more with the golf? Thing, yeah, actually, I think is what, is what, what I'm trying to say. That, you know, the, there's so much opportunity out there for them because they were so good at, at physical comedy. They were so good at, at using props yes. for comedy. Yes. So you think they would have made more of that rather than falling into this, you know, throwing mud around and all the rest of it, which I guess, mm-hmm. you know, that's that's what audience, well, that's what they felt audiences wanted back then. You know, they wanted that. Um, I think I mentioned this in my previous uh, essay on on their Purple Moon. Audiences wanted that kind of chase sequence, that sort of big build up and that big sort of frantic <laughs> fight at the end or whatever whatever it is, you know. And it, and it um, did work with preview audiences and general audiences, and they do work now with general audiences. Yeah. We, we look at it yeah. with a kind of a semi-academic eye and often alone, but yes. the Laurel and Hardys, like most of the best comedies, were tailored to a theatre audience reaction and the cumulative yes. effect. Yeah. And all done by previews and clever cutting to accommodate what they noticed in previews about the reactions. And and ultimately, I think, yeah, it's what they felt worked best with an audience. I mean, otherwise, uh, we're, we're back to comparisons with the uh, with their Purple Moment, the one immediately before. Why yeah. get rid of that elaborate scene with the costume and the midget dancers and all that in favour of splat yeah. in the face in the kitchen? Yes, which, yeah, exactly. Which doesn't work as well as the as the mud mud pie fight in this in this one. Um, That's right. Yeah. It, uh, Actually, that that reminds me of. I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull out your A to Z uh, again. Yes. Then. Um, you have the uh, is Kevin Brownlow wrote the forward for it, and he actually he writes just about that, and he, it's a really nice little mm. piece. Um, and where, where does he say now? Let me just, I'll find this piece here. I mean, I don't know why I'm reading your own forward to you, but. <laughs> well, just, it's, it's Kevin's forward. It really... He wrote it, really. <laughs> so it's really Kevin. <laughs> and he says, um, he, he once ran a print of Sid Chaplin in the, in the Better All. I thought it crudely acted and badly directed. Undoubtedly, the worst film I'd ever seen. But by watching it silent on my own, I had betrayed the whole point of cinema. Silent comedy, even more than its talky equivalent, needs an audience. I recently saw The Better All with a packed house at the Pordenone Film Festival in Italy. I thought it so funny, I fell off my seat. Along with the rest of the audience, I was hysterical with laughter. I would rate it among the best comedies I have ever seen. Mm. Yeah, that's it. You know, it's it's incredible. Yeah, yeah and, and I think it just does say you have to see, the, if, if you can possibly see these films in an audience, it's like seeing it for the first time. It is. You know, it really is. And you spot things, and it's not just because it's on a bigger screen. You're somehow more yeah. attuned by the, the, the by the communal reaction. It somehow attunes the mind yeah. to picking up on things yeah. that you hadn't noticed before. It's it's a yeah. totally different experience. And and yes, yeah. um, I don't think I've ever attended a screen you should maybe go home to a to a full size audience. But um, mm. I think if you if you yeah. if you were to do that, yes, you'd probably be surprised by the reaction. Yeah, I did it. Funnily enough, the, one of the last. Um, Blogcasts that that I did. Uh, it was your Don Tooting, the episode on your Don Tooting, and I interviewed um, Neil Brand mm. and uh, Ben yeah. Modell, two film companies, and the two f- the the film that they both picked out for their at all question films for their silent films was Wrong Again. Um, and again, it's because they've seen it obviously so many times on a big screen, mm. and the the reaction to it is just it works so much different. I mean, it's a great mm. little film, but I wouldn't have thought somebody would choose it as their sort of desert island silent short to keep with. No. But yet, the response to that film and and how it plays is far different to when you see it on 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 your own. And I guess I suppose ultimately what what we should be saying to people is if you get the opportunity to see, especially a silent mm. film on a big screen with an audience, you must take it because it is a different experience altogether than what we used Absolutely. to. Absolutely. And I've probably mentioned before that I'm, I'm involved with a group called Kennington Bioscope, which is based at the Cinema Museum in Kennington. And we present silent films with live music, usually piano, sometimes a bit more at the special weekends. We have a few more people in. And... Sometimes we do, if they've got an original using an effects track from the time, we'll use that. But primarily, I think, is silent film with live music on the big screen. And 
the way the comedies tend to go over, we get the odd dud that's inevitable, but by, by and large, by and large, um, the response, the the communal audience response to the comedies is phenomenal. And at yeah. this late date, we're looking at stuff, you know, century old. Yeah. But it works. It works in that environment, the environment for which these films were made. It still yeah. works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and I suppose if, if anybody is, is considering joining one of the Sons of the Desert Tents, and you get an opportunity to go in and watch a film, even if it's not on a big screen, mm. you are with an audience, you know, um, a, a respectful audience. Yes. Um, again, you you will you will have a different experience altogether. I know when I've attended the um, the conventions from time to time, just sitting in those those uh, film rooms, you know, with with fellow fans, mm. it's just a wonderful experience. Yeah. Wonderful yeah, experience. It's, it's- and I'm sure I'm sure should married men go home would would come alive in just the same it, way. Yes, really, very much. And um, well, I, I had been to Sons of the Desert events where it has been shown. Yes, and it does get that response. There, yeah. there is something special about a pleasure shared. Mm. Having a beer is nice. Yeah. Having a beer with somebody else is different. And yes, absolutely. Every now and then. It's like it's like a beautiful view, isn't it? A panorama. You could get, climb, climb a hill, look at a view. It's, it's great on your own, but to share it with somebody is a different, it, it, yeah, it, different experience. It really is. I'm sometimes of late been reminded of a line in Mel Brooks's The Producers. And I actually have a reason for remembering this, which I shan't detain you with. But um, it has something to do with uh, certain recent events in my life and um, yeah. in remembrance of a friend. And... When the, the, the crooked theatre producer, Max Bialystok, is trying to persuade accountant Leo Bloom to go into partnership with him, he tries to present a picture of how his quality of life would improve to get him out of that awful, restrictive job. And, and, yeah. and he says to him, and I, I apologise if this is a misquote, however slight, but um, did you ever sing a song? I mean, with somebody else. And that has come back to me a lot just lately. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah. Ever sing a, a song with somebody else? And if you stop and think about that, over our lives, probably we've very seldom done that. Yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah. Well, they say that the, the beauty of choral music, isn't it? If you're in a choir singing with other people, is just a, a, an absolutely mm. wonderful yes. experience. Yeah. Um, unless you're standing next to me. Oh, or well, me, actually, yes. <laughs> um, you know, if. Uh, as, as, as Groucho said of Harpo's vocal talents, if you call growling singing. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Fantastic. Well, we're getting pretty deep now. We've, we've, got, we've moved away from Laurel and Hardy. We're well, no, deep nothing now. wrong with a um, bit of cheap philosophy. <laughs> <laughs> cheap the word. Glenn, thank you ever so much for coming <laughs> and sharing your <laughs> thoughts today on uh, Should Married Men Go Home. It's absolutely brilliant. Uh, thanks, Patrick. You. I really enjoyed um, it. Hopefully... Hopefully you'll come on again and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll peruse another film. Yes, yes. Pick a film. I'll be back. Wonderful. That's wonderful. Thank you ever so much. Yep, it's been thanks great. again. And that's all for episode 19. I hope that today's show has maybe inspired you to go back and have another look at Should Married Men Go Home? Um, before we sign off for today, um, just a quick thank you to all those of you who ordered Blockhead's merchandise over the past few weeks. Um, I do hope you received your items in time for Christmas, and I've had uh, lots of nice comments from many of you, clearly very happy with your items. Um, uh, and also, I should probably mention my forthcoming book project. Um, those of you who follow my social media pages um, may have seen one or two of the Laurel and Hardy blog advent calendar videos throughout December. Um, and you may have noticed at the very end of the clips, uh, there's a little coming soon promotional teaser for my first Laurel and Hardy book release. Um, the book is entitled Laurel and Hardy Silence, um, and it's been created as an accompaniment to this podcast. Um, it's going to be a collection of my essays on all of the boys' silent films from The Lucky Dog right through to Angora Love. Um, I'm working on this very closely with my good friend, graphic designer and Laurel and Hardy superfan, Russell Babbage. And between us, we're creating a really beautiful tribute to Stan and Babe's silent pictures. Um, the book's going to be packed with tons of stills, many of which have never been published before. Um, it's scheduled for release in 2022, um, but obviously I'll keep you all informed as to the book's progress um, in the podcast as we go along. 
Uh, if you want to make sure you don't miss any updates, you can always join my new mailing list by heading over to blogheads.com um, and sign up to my newsletter there. Uh, and incidentally, I'm still looking for some stills, actually, from many of the boys' pre-team films. Um, so if you have any that you would like to contribute, fully credited, of course, um, I would really, really love to hear from you. Um, and all that's left to do, then, is to say thank you to today's guest, Glenn Mitchell. Thank you to the Bohunks Orchestra for the wonderful music. Um, and I have to say um, thank you to all of the many authors and experts whose work I use uh, producing my blogs and this podcast, of course. Uh, special thanks to Russell Babbage for all of his hard work and the blogcast's logos, the advent videos, all of the visuals uh, connected with the Laurel and Hardy blog. Um, and most importantly, thank you to you for choosing to spend this time with me once again. Next time, we'll be discussing the very divisive film, Early to Bed. Um, and all being well, we'll be welcoming back guests Randy Scretvet and Richard Ban. So, until then, it's goodbye from him. Goodbye. Goodbye from him. Goodbye. And it's a very goodbye from me. Goodbye. Goodbye.